Hello, I am Liz Visa, president of the Friends of the Public Garden, and I'm excited to welcome you to our virtual tour of the Public Garden. If it was a normal year, we would be inviting you into the garden with our tour guides, but as you know, we can't do that, and I'm still happy to be able to give you a virtual tour of some of the highlights of the garden. Let's start with a little bit of history. This is actually America's first botanical garden. It is 24 acres. But in the 1700s, where I am standing would have been the marshlands of the Charles River, where Bostonians swam and fished and dug for clams. The most famous moment in the 1700s is April 18th, 1775, made famous by Longfellow's poem about Paul Revere's ride. So you know they said one if by land and two if by sea, and the answer was two uh, lights in Old North. And those that sea that they were talking about was this space. So the British soldiers that were camped across Charles Street in the, in the common got into their boats and rowed across this land to the Cambridge shore and marched to Lexington and Concord to begin the Revolutionary War. In the 19th century, this garden space was a hotbed of civic fights. A number of times it was proposed that we develop house lots here. And those early advocates back then fought this idea. And finally, in 1856, there was a legislation that was passed by a record or, or a ratio of 60 to 1. Bostonians said, no, we want this to be forever a botanical garden. So from that moment forth, it was protected as a botanical garden. So in 1859, there was a competition, a blind competition, and architect George Meacham won that competition for the design of the garden. He was paid $100 for his labors, and his design is very similar to what you see today. Curvilinear paths, trees dotted throughout the lawns, and then the formal garden beds with horticultural, uh, beautiful horticultural beds. It was the height of the Victorian era, and we'll look at that in a little while when we get to the Arlington Street entrance. Those beds had exotic plants as well as annuals and uh, a central spine that was a formal path crossing the lagoon. So let's move forward to 1970. In the late 60s, it was a low point for parks nationwide, and our parks were no exception. It's hard to imagine that today, but this garden was almost beyond saving. The benches were broken, the lights were broken, there were holes in the three edges of the fencing, and the fourth edge along Boylston Street was gone altogether because there was a subway stop entrance at the corner of Arlington and Boylston in the garden. The Lagoon Bridge was close to collapse. So in 1970, a group of, of neighbors got together out of concern for the future of this garden. And very soon after that, they added the Boston Common and the Commonwealth Avenue Mall to their areas of concern, particularly because Dutch elm disease was ravaging the elm trees. We were losing 30 to 40 elm trees every year. And uh, elm bark beetles do not respect park boundaries. So the Friends of the Public Garden was born 50 years ago. It's our 50th anniversary this year. And in the beginning, we were worried about spending $500 to remove two diseased elms from the garden. So in 2020, our budget for parks care in the three parks is over $2 million. So let's take a look at our first stop, a very beloved sculpture in the public garden. So we are starting our tour at the duckling sculpture, which is probably the coolest sculpture in the city, if not in the country. It was done in 1987 by uh, sculptor Nancy Schoen, and we, the friends, worked with Nancy to get this installed in the garden. It is visited by hundreds of thousands of people, families and their children every year to come and sit on the ducklings, get their pictures taken. It honors and celebrates that classic uh, story Robert McCloskey wrote, Make Way for Ducklings. And so you see the ducklings dressed up today. They look like they're ready for a beach day. You also see when you come here seasonally that they are dressed in seasonal attire. If it's springtime around Easter, they have Easter bonnets. If it's around uh, St. Patrick's Day, they have shamrocks. When we're in the playoffs, they have uniforms of our sports teams. And a couple years ago, I think my personal favorite was when Ruth Bader Ginsburg published her book about the Supreme Court, they showed up as Supreme Court justices. They have been cared for by us since they were installed, and the Lynch family and foundation were very important supporters in the beginning and contributing money for an endowment to take care of them. They are beloved, and they are a wonderful, delightful part of the garden. So now we're gonna move down and talk about a tree.
Our next stop on our tour is that of the Dawn Redwood over here behind me. It is an amazing tree, a prehistoric tree, and it was actually thought to be extinct when it was rediscovered in China in the 1940s. This one here is about 50 years old, and we have three of them in the garden, one of which we planted a couple of years ago. You can see how beloved this tree is. This, this group of people are, are enjoying it, kids enjoy it. it. Has this gnarly bark and a wonderful fluted uh, trunk on the bottom. It really is a favorite place for people to come and enjoy. We actually have 437 trees in the garden and 159 unique specimens, cultivars, varieties. Behind me, over here to my right, is the lagoon. The central image in the garden, a very important part of the design. And you see the lagoon bridge crossing the lagoon. It was built in 1866, about a decade after the back bay was filled. And that neighborhood was growing fast. And at some point, it was clear that we needed a direct movement across the garden from Arlington Street to Charles Street down beyond the common into downtown. It was part of the original design. And this beautiful bridge was designed as a suspension bridge, but repairs over the years made it a girder bridge. Those cables are for um, decorative purposes, but they're not functional, but they are beautiful. Something you don't see in the lagoon, a very sad thing this year, is the swan boats. They began in 1877. They were developed by the Paget family, the original Pagets, Robert and Julia. It was inspired by the opera Lohengrin, where the hero is drawn by, on a boat by swans across the lake. And this is a, an iconic part of the garden. It's an iconic image of the city. People come, have come from generations to go and bring their children, their grandchildren to have a swan boat ride. They have operated through two world wars, through a depression, and this is the first year in all those years that it was very clear they could not operate it safely, so they sadly had to decide not to operate it. It means that next year we're going to be welcoming them with open arms and with a lot of excitement. And now let's go take a look at one of our wonderful monuments at the corner of Arlington and Beacon Streets in the garden. So while we're on our way to the White Memorial, I wanted to stop and show you something. It's this odd looking box on this tree. You may have asked yourself, what are those boxes doing on the trees? We work with an amazing couple called the Growing Tree, Norman Chris Healy. She's an entomologist and he is a soil scientist and arborist. And they have been working with the friends over the years to particularly focus on preserving our elm trees. As I said in the beginning, we were losing 30 to 40 elm trees a year. Dutch elm disease will never be eradicated, but we are doing an amazing job of trying to control the disease. And with the combination of their understanding of how the elm bark beetle functions, which is the carrier of the disease, and how it attacks the trees, we are using these elm bark beetle traps. They are putting it on non-elm trees. This is a Kentucky coffee tree. It confuses the elm bark beetles, it exhausts the elm bark beetles, they are attracted to it, they stick to it, and it also helps the Keeleys look at that trap, we have 24 of them, to say where is the concentration of the beetle, what the time of treatment is. It's helped us enormously over the last several years. Last year we actually lost not one elm tree in our three parts to Dutch elm disease. So as I said, we will never get rid of this disease, but we're doing some really amazing innovative work to try and control it. So now on to the White Memorial. We are now at the site of the George Robert White Memorial, a wonderful fountain here on the corner of Arlington and Beacon Streets. It was created in 1924 to honor a major philanthropist, George Robert White of the 19th century. It was done by Daniel Chester French. His commission was the Lincoln Memorial. That was the one that he was most well known for. So then he came up to Boston and worked with architect Henry Bacon to create more than just a piece of sculpture, but a whole space with the terrace and planting behind it. In the 80s, it went dry. It was not cared for. And for decades, it was a dry fountain until about 2015, when a neighbor came, uh, approached the friends and said, what about that fountain in the corner of Arlington and Beacon? Can we get this to work again? So we engaged him. He's now a member of our board. 
and we started a campaign and raised $700,000 from the community to not only restore the fountain, but set up an endowment for its care. We had to redo the water system to be circulating, create a new vault in the area of the fountain, historically restore the pebble basin, and we also created an accessible path off to the right, which is wonderful because people that are coming with their children in baby carriages, people in wheelchairs are all able to come and enjoy this wonderful part of the garden. Now we're gonna go take a look at the first monument that came in the public garden. We are now at the Ether Monument, the first monument that was placed in the garden in 1868. It was put up to celebrate an event, not a person. The event was the discovery of the anesthetizing effects of ether at Mass General Hospital. At the top, you can see an allegory of the, the Good Samaritan, a doctor performing that Good Samaritan gesture to the person in need. The fountain itself was also dry for quite a while and the friends working with the city restored it in the early 2000s and take care of it um, regularly every year. As with the White Memorial, it's really important that it not just be restored, but that we have this ongoing care because fountains are fussy things, but they're important and beautiful things. Everyone loves water. They love the running water here, and they're very attracted to both of these spaces. To my left here is another ancient tree, a ginkgo tree. In fact, this part of the garden has some of the oldest trees in the garden. This tree is about 150 years old. The species is believed to be about 250 million years old. Just imagine that ancient of a tree still being with us and still things that we can enjoy. And next, we're gonna be going to the Arlington Street entrance and look at some fountains and another sculpture. We are now at the Arlington Street entrance, which is the major iconic entrance into the public garden. Behind me is the George Washington statue. That was the second monument that arrived in the garden in 1869. It's a completely Massachusetts created statue. Thomas Ball, the sculptor, was born in Charlestown. The granite came from Quincy, Mass, and the foundry was in Chicopee, Mass. The other thing we see here is two child fountains on either side of the garden. There are four child fountains in the garden. They were all sculpted by women in the early 20th century. There are two on the other side of the lagoon. We have chosen this entrance to focus on for our 50th anniversary project here in the garden because the fountains are not functioning. They have not been functioning for quite a few decades. But you can see an example of that today where in one case there's too much water and it's overshooting the mark. And in the other case, there's very little water. So for decades they have not been working and need restoration and recirculating water like we did at the White Fountain. We also are gonna be rejuvenating the plantings at either side of the entrance that are old and tired. We'll be adding benches to make this a more wonderful place for the visitors to come and enjoy those fountains. Another thing to look at here are the plantings. The Victorian era was at its height when the garden was designed. And just imagine in 1888, there were 500 garden beds, horticultural beds, with 90,000 plants in them, annuals. And what you see here are seasonal plants that come out, palm trees and a variety of, of annuals are here to be displayed for people's delight. Today, there are 50 garden beds with 25,000 annuals and 35,000 tulips. The garden was the first place in America where tulips were displayed. People love the plantings, they're very important. And the park department has done them from the very beginning and they raised the, the plants at Franklin Park and the greenhouses. This is just a small slice of the public garden. There's more to discover on the rest of the 24 acres. I invite you to come for rest and renewal, for discovery or rediscovery, and to enjoy America's first public botanical garden.